Hi, welcome to my uh, lectures for uh, Anderson, uh, Anderson's Interchange with Kolodny and Cohen. Uh, as you may have gleaned by looking at the private government book, private government is actually a series of lectures that then uh, that has appended to it uh, comments from a number of folks who respond to different parts of Anderson's argument. Uh, what I've asked you to do is to read Col uh, Nico uh, Kolodny's uh, response to uh, Anderson's argument in private government and also Tyler Cohen's response uh, to Anderson in private government. And then at the very end of private government, as I'm sure you've seen, uh, Anderson then responds to these various contributors' particular responses. Now there are other, uh, you know, there are other folks who responded to Anderson, but I think uh, Kolodny and Cohen's questions are most on point for the themes of this course, so we're going to focus on them. Uh, this lecture is, I, I expect it to be fairly brief. It's going to, uh, the idea is to hold, is to clarify some of Anderson's main claims. We've read Schweikert now. I think we've learned more about political economies and workers' cooperatives. I think we're in a better position to uh, understand even better what Anderson was uh, going at. And I think we're also in a better position to uh, assess Kolodny and Cohen's questions and challenges for Anderson. So what I'm going to do in the next little bit is I'm going to discuss uh, Kolodny's responses, uh, uh, objections and challenges and Anderson's responses do the same for Cohen. I'll let you know when I'm transitioning from Claudney to Cohen. I'm going to make this one big lecture, but I think uh, it'll be a nice stopping point once I'm done discussing Claudney. Uh, you can, you know, you can go grab a sandwich or something and or just wait a few hours or what have you before coming back and watching the Cohen bit. I'm hoping this will clock in in about 50 minutes in total, but we will see. All right, let me jump in. Okay, so let's just get back on the table some key ideas from Anderson. And Kolodny helps uh, situate Anderson in the literature and political philosophy and helps re and reminds us what Anderson's up to. Uh, what Kolodny notes that, look, there's two different threads of literature in uh, philosophy, uh, at least English-speaking philosophy, the contemporary English-speaking philosophy, talking about equality and the value of equality. One thread of literature uh, that was really, uh, you know, kind of the focus of it all up until about 1999 or so was on this question of distributive justice. And here, for a lot of these folks, the important issue was what is the appropriate currency of distributive justice? So, so that idea in this literature was like, look, there's something that we want our social system to distribute equally. You know, some people think it might be income. Some people think it might be opportunities to earn income. Some people might think it's the quality of very particular bags of resources. Others might think that it's, no, what we want the system to do is create a quality of well-being, or maybe others quite create a quality of opportunities for well-being. There's, you know, there's all kinds of fine-brained arguments about what exactly it is that we want to dole out equally as a social system and political economy. Uh, Anderson uh, wrote a really, uh, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, a game-changing or a redirecting article in 1999, and I don't think she's the only one that was in this boat, but, you know, she's certainly kind of a landmark, saying, like, look, I'm not sure these issues about distributive justice are, you know, these questions about what the appropriate currency are, are really getting to the point, the thing that we really care about in, uh, when it comes to uh, equality. She, you know, her idea is that, look, we don't, it's not so important exactly how goods or resources or well-being or whatever uh, gets distributed amongst people. What matters is that we ex live in relationships of equality, relationships where no one is dominating someone else, relationships where everyone has a kind of uh, civic freedom of the kind Rousseau was talking about. That's what we should be concerned with as philosophers and political philosophers. So here is this, this, this thing that that should be familiar to you by now, now that we've read Rousseau and Anderson and Schweikert, who are all, you know, talking in the same way. Uh, for Anderson, what she's interested in is a world uh, where people can live in relationships of equality, relationships of non-domination, where their interests are considered equally, uh, you know, as reflected by the rules that govern the society. Their say, uh, they, they, they all have roughly equal say, and everyone's given equal esteem. There's no it's not like some people are 
naturally superiors to others. There's no castes. There's no need to uh, uh, fawn and scrape and ritually express uh, one's commitment to the superiority of any parts of the population. So the idea is that for Anderson, what's important is this complex of equal consideration of one another in, in our relationships. And, you know, her idea is that this is something that we are trying to do when we construct democratic uh, institutions for the state, like a democratic legislature. And then, as you uh, know by now, she says, look, we really should be trying to do that same thing in the workplace because the same sorts of values uh, and concerns are in play there. Uh, okay, so that's just to get, you know, get back up to speed with Anderson's project. Kolodny, at the very early uh uh, early passages in his response to Anderson says, "Hey, uh, here's what Anderson, here's what Anderson's doing," and and he even says, "Look, I really like this turn. I think this relation of equality turn is a nice way uh, to be framing things." Okay, but he does. Uh, oh, and then he does a little bit more summary here. He finds two basic lines of criticism in Anderson. Uh, the let me point to the second one on the on your slide here first. Uh, the, the one criticism is that employers, you know, uh, uh, one line of criticism he found he finds is where Anderson, you know, makes the case, explains why it is that employers are given discretion as authorities. Uh, you know, they have to make decisions about hiring and firing, coordinating activities of workers, and so on, because of the economies of scale and the necessity of governing these interaction and this productive activity uh, in these economies of scale in an authoritative manner, as opposed to some sort of transactional or contractual moment-by-moment -moment manner. The idea is that employers do need to be given discretion in order to perform this coordinating in the firms, you know, in the factories, in the, you know, maybe the big restaurant chain or what have you, in order to pr produce the good or services that, uh, that the firm produces most efficiently, best, reaping the advantages of these economies of scale uh, that we find ourselves uh, able to achieve if only we are properly coordinated by folks in the workplace. Uh, now, Claude, uh, Anderson's first line of criticism of the way workplaces are, con uh, are currently structured is that although they need discretion in order to achieve these economic gains, the gains of economies of scale, uh, they are prone to abuse this discretion. So we need to figure out ways to curb that ability to abuse discretion. Uh, so her idea is that, look, the, the reason why they have this authority in the workplace, why employers have authority in the workplace, place is to maximize productivity in the workplace, efficiency, uh, economic production in the workplace, but it's not to do things that are outside of that portfolio or outside of that objective, such as imposing your political views or enrich enriching oneself or just treating your, you know, your, your employees unfairly. And so Anderson, one line of criticism in Anderson's book is like something needs to be done uh, the workplace structure needs to be changed, the governance structure needs to be changed so that employers can't so easily abuse their discretion. Okay, so that's one line of criticism. Uh, another line of criticism is this idea that uh, the workplace needs to be restructured uh, because right now it systematically makes some people bosses and other people uh, you know, followers or obeyers uh, where the bosses have no kind of accountability to the uh, to the folks over whom they are the bosses, and Anderson's idea is that it's deeply problematic to be in a position of inferiority uh, like that, where you just have to do what you're told and you have very little say uh, about what you're told. Uh, the bosses are not uh, held accountable to you in any systematic way. Her idea is that that's deeply problematic. Kolodny wants to focus on this first criticism uh, in, you know, in your slide, the one at top. I discussed it second, but it's the, the first one in your slide here. This, he wants to push and challenge uh, Anderson about you know, how problematic it is to be in this position of inferiority. Um, now, just a quick word. Uh, Anderson diagnoses both the abuse of discretion problem and the uh, and the uh, position of authority problem as related to this phenomenon of private governance, where 
and where private governance is defined as a situation where one set of folks, the employers, are uh, are the, employer, the managers at, uh, at the place of work. They give orders, and everyone else in the uh, you know they they assign tasks. They say how things need to be done, when they need to be done, and all these kinds of things. They give those orders, uh, and the folks who are ordered, the employees, uh, are required to follow. They must obey. And, but in this relationship of governance, it's private governance because the employees have very little or no say in the construction of the rules uh, that, that they must follow and uh, the directives that they must follow. Uh, so she sees both the abuse of governance, or the, the abuse of this governance authority, and the, uh, the problematic inferiority uh, that's kind of baked into this you know, the workplace as just being two aspects of this problematic phenomenon of private governance uh, of adults in the workplace. She sees the remedy as requiring measures to restore equality to the workplace, understood you know in most abstract terms as you know these basic things that we you know we that she repeatedly associates with equality or non-domination or republican freedom. That is the rules in the workplace and such. Uh, are made in a way that takes into account the say of everyone governed. It, the rules that reflect the considerations of interests uh, of everyone, uh, you know, in in the appropriate in appropriate measures, not privileging any one set of person's interests over the other, and the rules uh, and just the conditions in the workplace uh, foster an equality of esteem, where no one is treated as kind of a privileged special caste. No one's uh, 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 you know, owed any kind of uh, any kind of social deferential treatment. No one should be bowed to. No one should be, you know, seen as some sort of natural superior in the workplace. Uh, so she sees as a remedy to these two problems, these two critiques of the contemporary workplace, just doing things to introduce to restore this egalitarian value to the workplace. And and the question is how to go about doing that. Now here's what here's uh, Kolodny's challenge. Claudney wants to figure, wants to, you know, set the abuse of discretion problem to the side. He'll just say, yeah, yeah no brainer, that's a problem. Uh, we need to do something about that. Uh, but he wants to focus on uh, 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 Anderson's other claim uh, that uh, this claim at the top here is deeply problematic to be in a position of inferiority. It's deeply problematic for employees that they are in this position of inferiority, that, that they are governed and uh, they're subject to the private governance of their employers. They have no say in the rules that guide them in the workplace. Now, Kolodny's challenge is to, he asks Anderson to just get clear on what's so bad about that relationship. He wants to, he's sympathetic, but he's like, what exactly is it that's so bad about not having a say in the workplace? Uh, and so he wants, and in particular, he wants to say, you know, what if we're able to put rules into place that maintain the unaccountability of the employers or, or actually do very little to hold them accountable directly to the employees, uh, doesn't really give them a say? Uh, what would be wrong? What's wrong about that? Uh, so long as one situation is made materially decent. Yeah, that's my stab at what Claudine might be up to. Here's a, here's a sentence where he uh, uh, most concisely said, you know, uh, marshals this challenge. Our question again is what's especially problematic about being under the governance of another person after we have control for things that you can suffer, suffer even without that yoke? And the idea is like, yeah, um, so we might imagine that uh, you're in a workplace and you're required to work very hard, and you're required to work at a high pace, and this is due to the rules that are being set uh, by the employers with no accountability. Uh, but then imagine that, you know, this alternative situation, maybe you're not in a workplace, maybe you're a mom and pop, uh, you know, worker, and because of the demands of the market, where there's no authority relationship, uh, maybe in order to compete with others, maybe you have to work at that same high pace and maybe the conditions are going to be just as difficult because you have to keep the cost of production really low uh, in your private little shop. Uh, so maybe your conditions are 
uh, even without uh, in in this other arrangement where there's no authority over you, may, maybe the maybe your material conditions they might just be just the same. And so then his question is, it, you know, if we were to control for that, kind of we just make sure that the conditions in the workplace, uh, you know, meet some decent level of you know material well-being, something that's not too different than what you might face. Uh, even if you weren't governed by uh, a, an employer who has authority over you, if you so if we were to get things to that level, would there still be a problem with being subject to the unaccountable authority of those over of, of your employers? And he's not so sure about that. He's like scratching his head. Tell me, Anderson, what exactly is problematic about that? Uh, if we were to just fix these levels of material well-being. Why do we have to do these other things? Why do we care about equal say? Why do we why do we have to get so worked up about this? Okay, so Anderson's response comes in the form of two uh, uh, examples, and I'm going to uh, take you know, I, I'm going to just read uh, each of these examples, and then I'm going to sum up what I take her point to be her punchline. You know the point of bringing up that example to be the first one is uh, this example of NASA astronauts that's on page 127 128 of a reply to Kolodny uh, and so this is way back uh, uh, it, this is uh, about this strike of astronauts on this space station Skylab uh, in 1973 December 28 1973 uh, kind of early days of NASA Okay, so right before this, so this is a strike of astronauts. Astronauts went on strike in 1973, interestingly. Uh, days before the strike, uh, the astronauts in Skylab, this is, what, this is how it was going for them, NASA began by sending extremely specific instructions about minute-by-minute -minute tasks for the astronauts to accomplish. They tried to keep up for two weeks, but found themselves falling behind as there was no room in the schedule for the natural delays that happen at work. Moreover, they were exhausted with these 16-hour days. When they fell behind, NASA began demanding less sleep and working through their meal breaks. So the astronauts began to, com uh, uh, began to complain to Mission Control. But NASA's response was that they were whining. Mission Commander Jerry Carr and his crew demanded a day off. NASA refused. So Carr simply shut off the radio, and the astronauts took the day off they wanted. Because, you know, after all, no one can come get you when you're up in space. Uh, after the one-day strike, NASA finally came to terms with the astronaut. The next day, December 29th, NASA agreed to quit micromanaging the astronauts, allowed them to take their full meal breaks, and just send, set, sent them a list of tasks for the day and let them figure out how to get it done. You know, treat them like adults. And it worked. All the projects got done before the mission ended. So Anderson's point here is that, look, uh, they were given the same amount of work, but it, mass, NASA backed off and said, okay, you figure out how to do it. We're not going to micromanage when and how you do it. And then they did it. And, and Anderson says, look, there's a deeper lesson here, and I'll just read once again uh, her lesson. Uh, exercising uh, autonomy, directing oneself in tasks, no matter how exacting and relentless they are, is no ordinary good. It is a basic human need. Having a genuine say in how's one, how, one work, how one's work is directed, even when must adjust to the claims of others, you know, like the different astronauts had to figure out how they're going to do the work together, as in a collectively governed workplace, and even when one doesn't get one's way, still is an exercise of autonomy in the decision-making process, if not the outcome. So her idea here is that, look, having a say is in itself a good. It's, a, it's as much as a good as like any of these material things, like you know, getting an income or you know, having good food to eat or whatever. It's a basic thing that humans want, and they suffer when they don't get it. Uh, it's a basic human need, says Anderson. So Anderson's going to say, one thing that's wrong with relationship of inferiority, even if you control for uh, material, you know, uh, disadvantages and stuff that uh, th that that you might face, you know, when you're outside of relationship of inferiority, uh, uh, and you know, Anderson's claim is like it is a good in itself not to be in the relationship of inferiority. It is a good in itself to have a say in how one conducts one's life, you know. Uh, you know, through major portions of the day. human It's a human basic need to do this. So even if you're just as well off, uh, or even maybe a bit, uh, quite a bit better off in relationships of inferiority for whatever reason, you're still going to suffer in a way. There's something that you're missing that is a basic human need. 
And she thinks that the NASA astronauts example does a pretty good job illustrating this. This is a basic human value disposition need and that, and, and that is valuable in its own right. Okay, now then the second uh, example she has is uh, is this example from Amazon workers. And here I'm going to say the point, the, the punchline, uh, and then I'm going to read it and then I'll repeat the punchline. Uh, just so you can see what she's getting at. And so remember for her, uh, to be in an inferiority position is to be in a position where you don't have e equal say, where your say counts for little or nothing at all, and your interests are not, uh, they're, they're not treated equally. Other interests are uh, privileged over yours in a systematic way. And then what goes with that too is there's a kind of inequality of esteem. Like some people just deserve to be uh, taken into consideration and other people don't. They, they, there's a kind of social standing that they have that you lack when you're in this relationship of inferiority. Now, with the Amazon workers example, I think what, uh, what Anderson wants to say is that all these things kind of go together. They, they, even though they're conceptually distinct, they cluster to one, with one another. Just as a matter of the way human psychology works and uh, the way th you know, things work in human relations, uh, to, to get equality of treatment of one's interests, one has to have equality of say. Uh, you, you, you have to be your own advocate. And if you don't have any say, if those who order you are not accountable to your say, then systematically your interests are going to be disregarded. That's the point. Uh, so let me just, uh, uh, and so what she says is Amazon treats workers, vital interests as of no account in comparison with its customers relatively trifling, uh, trifling interests. Um, so let me just read this bit so you can see what she has in mind. I won't read all of it, but I'll read a big chunk of it. Let's peek inside Amazon warehouses to see how the company treats its employees and temps. The pace of work is unremitting. Workers are reprimanded for time theft when they pause to catch their breath after an especially difficult job. They're subjected to ever-increasing quotas, constantly yelled at for not making their quotas, threatened daily with discharge, and eventually fired when the required pace gets too high for them to meet, a fate of the vast majority of Amazon's hires. But not before they suffer injury on the job. Workers have to get on hands and knees hundreds of times per day, a practice that leaves few unscathed. Amazon forces them to sign papers affirming that their injustices are not work-related, if they are given demerits that can lead to discharge. In 2011, at its Allentown, Pennsylvania warehouse, Amazon allowed the indoor heat index to rise to 102 degrees. When employees asked to open the loading doors to let air circulate, a common practice at other warehouses, Amazon refused, claiming this would lead to employee theft. Instead, it parked ambulances outside waiting for employees to collapse from heat stroke. Okay, it goes on and on like this. There's more, you know, she goes on and on. She's particularly pissed at Amazon. Uh, but her idea, her, her point is that's Amazon and there's a lot of other workplaces that are like this. I think meatpacking plants would be another, uh, you know, paradigm example of this kind of stuff uh, where, you know, the place where folks process poultry or chicken or, uh, or uh, beef or what have you. Uh, but those are just a couple of places. Her idea is this happens a lot. And her point is that, look, if you don't have a say, if you don't have some sort of vote, if you can't hold those who are giving you orders accountable, then uh, your interests are systematically going to be uh, uh, not treated uh, well, uh, you know, not given their due. As she says again here, Amazon treats workers' vital interests as of no account in comparison with its customers' relatively trifling interests in, say, you know, having, uh, you know, having cheaper products are you know getting their getting their products maybe a day or two earlier than they might otherwise have if these interests were protected. Okay, so 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 these are her two big responses to Kolodny. She just wants she here in her response to Kolodny she fleshes out what exactly it is she thinks is problematic about inferiority relationships. And it's not just a matter of having, you know, meeting some sufficient level of well-being that one might, you know, as Claudine says, uh, it's not quite right that, you know, you fail to see something if you think that there's nothing problematic about being under the governance of another person, if so long as you've controlled for things that you can suffer even without that control. 
her point is, well, uh, it's a bad in itself to be controlled without having any say. And then also it turns out as a matter of fact that you won't do a very good job at all of controlling for the things you can suffer without the authoritative yoke if you don't have that say. So that and so she has you know she has these two points to respond to Claudine's challenge about what is exactly wrong about being made an inferior. Okay, uh, finally Claudine has uh, this consistency challenge, uh, and he he states it as follows: the rhetorical tendency of Anderson's lecture is to equate the situation of the employee with the situation of the political subject. And so to demand of the employee everything that we would demand for the subject. But surely she thinks that the situation of the employee is different, and that the firm gets a pass on something a state wouldn't. I doubt that she would insist on workplace democracy. So what puts the brakes on the rhetorical momentum toward full equivalence? Okay, so her so here let me just summarize Claudine's point here. It's like, okay, Anderson talks like this situation in the workplace is just like the situation in the state. That uh, you, that we need a political structure that gives as much of uh, control and voice to, uh, to to employees as you see in in like the democratic process that elects legislatures and all those kinds of things. And he says, well, that seems a little extreme, and I doubt that she would insist that we just basically put little mini legislatures in all these workplaces. That seems like overkill, that, and that seems like a problem. And then Anderson's response uh, to this is, is uh, well, it's as follows. Uh, she says, well, she has a kind of measured response. Uh, you know, the first thing she says is that she recognizes that there, is a there are disanalogies between the state and the workplace. Uh, and one of the big ones is that in the workplace, you need a level of control of people's behavior in order to coordinate the productive activity that you just don't need. That would be problematic in the state because you don't need the state control to produce the public goods that the state helps us produce. But in the workplace, you do need this kind of tight control. So her idea is that, look, it, you know, it shouldn't be regulated in exactly the same way because you have to make allowances for the kind of control that you need in the, in the, in the workplace in order to reap these uh, benefits of economies of scale. You know? uh, so she recognizes that. Uh, but, but then she says, but, uh, so, so notice here where uh, Claudine says, I doubt that she would insist on workplace democracy. Well, here, you know, I, her position is, well, I'm not going to insist on workplace democracy, but I, I hope to have shown that there's a problem here and that we need to become good social scientists about this. And, the, and we can't, like, just argue from the armchair. We can't just offer uh, a priori arguments to settle what a just constitution workplace governance would look like. Well, we need to like put. We need everything needs to be on the table. We need to experiment to learn the costs and benefits of different forms of workplace governance. The main point in these lectures is the problem of workplace governance needs to be put on the table for what it is: a problem of government, not of markets or freedom of contract. So her idea is: well, maybe we do need workplace democracy, but we need to do more investigation. We need to experiment and try to tackle this problem and try to heal the, these problems of uh, non uh, of, of of no accountability uh, and and inequality in the workplace. And she, you know, she notes, and I'll, I'll rehearse this again uh, at a later point in the lecture, she notes that really, as far as she can tell, there are four different measures that we might be able to take, and the idea is to engage in experiments with respect to all four of them. Uh, one is to improve exit options of the employee, make it to where the employee can just leave a bad workplace and that can help make conditions better in a workplace and can, can restore a kind of accountability to the workplace. Another is uh, to make sure that big companies in particular have employees' handbooks that specify what everyone's duties and rights are in the workplace and hopefully gives a way for, uh, for managers to be held accountable. Uh, another is workplace constitutions, which is state limits on what the employers can do. You know, things like harassment laws and laws requiring min minimal working and safety conditions. But then the fourth thing is employee say. 
uh, some sort of say in, in the decision-making process of how the firm's going to be run and what it's going to do and what the employees are going to do. Uh, and, you know, we've with Schweikert, we considered at length uh, these worker-owned cooperatives, these worker-managed firms. There's other things that are short of that, like uh, con contemporary union structures under collective bargaining are something like you might find in Germany, but not so much in Canada, where there's a co-determination between the workers, councils, and, uh, and management uh, about what the firm's going to do. So, but her idea is that, look, private governance is a problem. It threatens this value of equality and Republican freedom. And we should be alert to the fact that there is a problem and then figure out what we can do to address that problem while preserving uh, our, the gains that we can get from the authority structures in these workplaces. So to be clear, she's not saying to get rid of the authority structures. You know, we need managers to get the efficiency gains. She's saying we need to figure out ways to to keep those managers from abusing their discretion and to keep those managers uh, uh, accountable to the employees and accountable to you know equally treating the interests of everyone involved. Okay, that concludes uh, my discussion of the interchange between uh, Kolodny and Anderson. I believe what's particularly useful about that interchange is that Kolodny, you know, presses Anderson to get clearer on what she's really trying to show in her private government uh, book and what her key commitments are and what, and what her key theses are. Hopefully this is, you know, made a bit clearer to you what she's up to. Uh, at this point, you might want to take a break and go grab that sandwich or just you know, go do something else for a while before uh, coming back for the uh, following half of this lecture, which I will begin right now. So, the, so Tyler Cohen and Elizabeth Anderson have a less friendly exchange here. Uh, I think you could, and there, there are points, in, particularly in Anderson's response, where she's clearly a little, uh, having a hard time controlling her passion. She's a little pissed off at Cohen. Uh, she gets a little personal with him uh, here and there. I'm not going to focus on that, though. Hopefully that, you know, that might make the readings here coming toward the end of the term a little bit more enjoyable to watch two prominent uh, uh, academics uh, you know, take off the gloves a little bit and get a little nasty. Uh, but I won't focus on that part. I'll let you find it for yourself. But uh, I, uh, I do want to uh, clarify what the issues are that these folks are debating uh, and, and you know, clarify what Cohen's objections are to Anderson's theses and you know, give you an idea of how Anderson responds. At the very least, I want to help you see where in these two articles uh, the, the guts of their argument can be found and what those main what the main organs are in their argument. Okay, so let me just say, let me just kind of give my capsule summary of Cohen's argument to Anderson. His argument is, actually there's, there's, there's probably more to it than what I'm gonna rehearse here. It's got a, a lot of nooks and crannies. I think I'm gonna give you the most powerful points here, and I think I'll, uh, I'll do rough justice to the argument. Uh, and then I'll do basically the same for Anderson, because she responds in a whole bunch of different ways. And I've tried to wrestle it into some structure uh, to help you folks. I, I, one thing I must say is, to my mind, this Tyler, this Cohen and uh, Anderson interchange, I think this takes us to like the cutting edge of this area of study. I don't think either of them really says anything satisfying on their own behalf in the end, but I think what they've done is clearly set the stage or the terrain of debate, like the things that we really need to work out to make progress with uh, about what to do about private government in the workplace. Okay, so here's what Cowan says. Uh, the first thing, uh, yeah, here, here's what Callan says. You know, the first thing is, is that Callan and Anderson have a bit of common ground. They both agree that you need authorities in the workplace because the, author because the authorities need to coordinate uh, the employees by, being, by issuing you know, authoritative rules and directives that the employees obey in order to reap the gains, the productivity gains and efficiency gains of workplace production. But, uh, but Cowan 
uh, you know, allows for something that I think Anderson would reject. He says, well, employers' discretion to coordinate in order to get those efficiency gains ineliminably entails a capacity to abuse that discretion. And here's the point. This is where he's really going to deviate from uh, Anderson. Any robust constraint on that discretion will not be worth the cost in terms of the efficiency gains. Uh, and he, you know, he says a few things to back up what he says there. You know, one thing he points out is that code de determination and other forms of worker say come at a high price in terms of economic productivity and efficiency. And his main, uh, you know, what he, and he cites this one article where the main finding is that uh, is that German workplaces that have code determination, this this kind of accountability relationship. This is short of a worker-owned cooperative. It's not exactly the same as the union. It's where the, the workers and management actually, you know, work together to figure out how the workplace is going to be run, what rules are going to be issued. What he points out is that those forms of workplaces actually have lower profits than uh, have lower profits than your you know more traditional. Uh, more hierarchical capitalist firms. And he sees the fact that they tend to have these lower profits, he sees that as evidence that the production in the workplace is not doing as, is not as productive or efficient as production in uh, your typical more hierarchical workplaces. Anderson's going to call that into question in a number of ways, but this is what he, he, he cites. He cites this study that shows that profits are consistently lower in these co-determining firms than in more hierarchical firms. Uh, and then he also suggests that co-determination, other firms of workers say, come with their own cost to autonomy and quality of workplace. And, and, I, and, and I think this is probably right. Schweikert even knows, notices this. Uh, remember we read Schweikert. One of the things he says is that what you get in a workplace is you get stronger social sanctions from one worker to another uh, when some some worker there's more social monitoring and like busybodiness uh, when there is a, a workers cooperative uh, the workers kind of monitor one another's performance more because they're engaged in this task and they all kind of have buy-in and so they're critic they're more likely to criticize one another for their failures rather than just leaving it to the boss to do it. And Schweiker, uh, here, Cohen is saying, yeah, you see something like this in, in workplaces where there's German-style co-determination, co uh, that, that there's a way in which your privacy is infringed and you're, kinda, you're, you're getting bossed around by a lot of folks, uh, not just your boss, but you're getting uh, at least scolded, not necessarily bossed, but scolded by, a lot by your uh, fellow employees. And Cohen reads that as a kind of cost, kind of a problem. Interestingly, Schweikert knows the same thing and thinks that this is actually a good thing about uh, the, the, the employee accountability workplace uh, in the democratic firm. Okay, so, uh, so, so anyway, so Cohen's big point is to sum up is that any robust constraint on the employer's discretion to coordinate efficient production in the workplace will not be worth the cost. That's a key thesis. A second key thesis is that employer, abu employer abuses of this discretion, they're actually not that common and they're really not that bad. And he, uh, uh, I'll give you some page numbers where he you know, makes that argument. And then his third main point is that enough of Anderson's worries can be cured simply by improving the ex exit options of employees. And the exit option is like the ability to leave the workplace and go find another job. As, as long as you make it easy enough for the employee to leave the workplace, they can they, they're in a strong position to to bargain with the employer for the condition for the package of working conditions and pay that they might want. And so uh, Cohen's idea is that here, just leave this to the market. Let rational adults in the labor market decide what kind of workplace conditions they're happy with. And they can just, you know, the employee can protect uh, himself or herself just by, you know, you know by the power of exit. Uh, you know, they can they can vote with their feet and leave, and that will that will be enough to cure the bulk of the abuses and to respect the employee's uh, autonomy.
So, uh, so he says, uh, so, so just to summarize, uh, Anderson, or Cohen's idea is that if employees exit option is sufficiently robust, that they can easily enough exit a job and find another, the, the workers and employees will be able to weigh packages of, a, of abuse versus compensation and, cho and choose, uh, and choose uh, amongst these packages offered uh, by the employer in the labor marketplace. So it could be, you know, so the idea is that, look, uh, here in this work, in this, in this workplace, it's like Amazon, they're not giving me pee breaks, they're making me work at a really high pace. Uh, but if I don't like it, uh, and if I don't think the pay here is worth it, uh, I can go somewhere else that maybe will pay me a little less for better working conditions. Uh, so, so Cohen's idea is like, look, as long as we shore up this exit option to a sufficient degree, every, the market will take care of everything else. Uh, and then he adds that we should let employees decide for themselves whether, what trade-off of compensation and working place conditions that they desire. There's something paternalistic uh, uh, on Anderson's part by wanting to force employers to 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 offer some minimum set of conditions. Now his idea is like, well, maybe employees want better pay and they're willing to pay off, to trade off that better pay for the harder working conditions. Uh, you know, I, I think a, a clear example of that uh, might be something like, uh, and this is something that appeals to a lot of young folks. Uh, when I was a kid, this was a sort of, uh, in college anyway, this was kind of a romantic thought. I never uh, uh, followed it uh, probably for good because I'm sort of clumsy and I probably would be missing an arm or something at this moment had I followed this thought. But it's it's not so uncommon for kid for for college age folks to go work for a fishery and go work on a fishing vessel or or you know a, a cannery which is really arduous physical labor and dangerous labor but you get paid super well. Um, you know I think you know Cohen's idea is that we should let employees decide on their own little package of pay for how, for, and working conditions, they should be able to decide. We should have a marketplace that offers all of these options to them. We shouldn't have busy bodies like Anderson coming in and saying like, no, 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 we're not gonna let you uh, have this, this, the, this fishing job uh, or you know, things like this because uh, we know better for you and we know that you should take the working conditions over the the, qual the, the, the pay that you want. Uh, Cohen's idea is like, you know, just let the adults decide for themselves what package they want. Okay, so, so Cohen's argument is kind of complex. It's got these three parts. It's, it kind of, I, think it's, I think the cumulative force of these is supposed to you know, be his response to Anderson. Uh, they kind of all work together and mutually support one, other, one another against Anderson's case. Now, what is Anderson's case? What is her general case? Uh, her ge so her general case is that, is that, look, she doesn't object to limited government in the workplace, but she objects to private government, uh, the subjection of workers to arbitrary, unaccountable government, uh, government in the workplace, in which they have no voice other than what their employers care to give them, which is often none at all, and are vulnerable to abuses of power. And then she adds, a free society of equals cannot be founded on an institutional structure, which the vast majority of workers for most of their productive lives labor under such government. And then she adds, and here's where you see her opposition to Cohen's position. I discuss four ways to promote the freedom and equality of workers. Exit, rule of law constraints on employers, constitutional rights, and voice. And she argues that the first three alone are not sufficient. Workers need some voice within the workplace to protect against employer abuse of power, and more generally, to empower them to assert their standing, respectability, and autonomy interests in the workplace. Okay, uh, so remember what Cohen is saying is that, look, just give folks a decent exit option, uh, and everything else is going to take care of itself. And she's saying, look, not only is an exit option not enough, exit, rule of law, constraints on employers, and constitutional rights, that, that, that package wouldn't even be enough without voice. It's only by giving people voice in the workplace. Something like 
collective bargaining or uh, worker-owned cooperatives or co-determination. You need some permutation on that where there's actual voice and democratic say uh, if you're going to uh, restore a sufficient level of equality to the workplace. And we need to do that and we should do that. And as she says in our last sentence, we certainly need to be investigating and experimenting uh, with respect to different versions of voice uh, uh, to solve this problem. And then now she has a whole bunch of specific responses to Cohen, which I was, uh, and they're, they're kind of like a bunch of cats running around in, in this chapter. Uh, and I'm going to try to herd the cats and, and, uh, and you know, work through, through them a little bit more methodically than she does. Once again, I think the reason why things get a little uh, less structured in Anderson's response here so I think we really are starting finally to get at the cutting edge. These are the kinds of empirical issues and, and some philosophical issues about uh, whether it's possible and how to, if possible, to restore accountability to the workplace. Those kinds of things really need to be worked out. We're really at the cutting edge of the philosophical literature here. And now I think that's why Anderson's just sort of a mess in this response because, uh, because there's nothing... You know, there, there's just a lot of work to be done, both empirical and philosophical, to, to you know to, to, to begin you know breaking ground at this cutting at, at, at this edge of, of of the inquiry of the state of inquiry. But let me so well, let me enumerate some of these. You know, remember one of the things that Cohen said is that really even now uh, uh, employee abuses of the discretion that they have to coordinate efficient production. Those abuses, uh, you know, Cohen says those abuses, abuses, they're really not very common, and they're not really that bad. They're not that grave. And here, Anderson's ire is really raised. If you, here's where she gets, uh, she says like the nastiest things that she's she's going to say to Cohen here. I'll let you find those for yourself. But here's some things that she adduces to say. Look, uh, Anderson or Cohen, you just haven't studied this closely enough. And she enumerates just a number of facts that she says in, is just the tip of an iceberg of facts like this about workplace conditions, particularly for, say, the bottom 50% or so, or maybe 60% or so in the American workplace. Uh, for one thing she points out, she says, you know, recent, all these are things from recent studies. So a recent study says that 90% of female restaurant workers report being subject to sexual harassment. Uh, between 2007 and 2012, 93% of investigations of garment factories in Southern California found labor violations, sometimes sweatshop-like conditions. You know, that's pretty, you know, 93% of the time, uh, employers are breaking the law when it comes to minimum labor conditions, uh, and sometimes dramatically so. That, that, is, that suggests a very high rate of employer abuse of, of the discretion. A recent study of workers in the poultry industry, and here we're talking about meat packers, the folks that are cut, you know, chopping up those chickens and gutting them and feathering them, defeathering them and all that stuff. A recent study of workers in the poultry industry found that the vast majority were not allowed adequate bathroom breaks. Many are forced to wear diapers. A recent study estimates that about 7 million workers in the United States have been pressured by their bosses to favor some political candidate or issue uh, are, are, are some political issue by threat of job loss or wage cuts or plant closure. Uh, yet another, it's a, there's a common practice of assigning unreliable shift schedules, uh, per, particularly for folks working in this you know, bottom 60%, folks working at grocery stores or Walmart or uh, you know, these various uh, plants that I'm describing. And what it is is that companies don't know exactly how much work they're going to need and they want to be super efficient, and so they don't want to assign any more hours uh, than they need to, and they, and they want those, assign, those hours to be assigned at exactly the perfect point in time for them to meet their production targets. And so there's this common practice of assigning unreliable shift schedules to employees uh, in the United States. Uh, I think this is something you see in Canada a lot, too. Uh, but, of course, you can imagine how disruptive this is for the everyday life of any person employed. Uh, in, in these various places. It's very hard to be a reliable parent when you don't know when uh, and if you're going to be working uh, uh, any given week. 
And then finally, she, she cites uh, high instances of wage theft from companies such as Walmart. And wage theft is where uh, the, the, the companies just don't pay wages. They, they deem certain hours as uh, unpayable hours. Uh, or they'll, or they won't pay like overtime wages and these kinds of things. Uh, there are studies you know, that that she cites that indicate that this is actually a very uh, uh, common practice to, to nickel and dime your employees like this. Uh, you know, of course, in service of maximizing the bottom line, uh, the, the the profit. Uh, and you know, and then Anderson's point is like, look, all these abuses are not things that serve uh, you know, the productivity of these places. They might serve the, the profit to the shareholders, but that's very different than productivity, like how much good is being, how much goods are being produced and that sort of thing. And, and her point is that, look, these are, these conditions are pretty bad for a large number of folks in the United States. And, and this is uh, like a systematic feature of what's going on in a lot of places in the United States. Uh, for me, uh, it's always a question, you know, how much Canada, you know, tracks these things. You know, there's a lot of stuff written about the economy in the United States, uh, and I'm researching in this literature. Uh, I, uh, I think just abidingly, Canada, Canada's not quite as well studied, so it's actually harder to get statistics like this. And I always do wonder in this course, you know, how, where Canada maps on to these features of the U.S. I suspect that generally things are, on all these dimensions, things are pretty bad in Canada too, uh, but on a scale of 1 to 10, if the U.S. is a 10, Canada is like a 6 or 7 or something like that. Not sure how that, fit, you know, figures into all our arguments in the course, uh, uh, but I thought I would just note that, that look, uh, I recognize that much of what we've seen is, uh, it's stuff about the United States. It's about, about that economy of 320 million people just to the south of us. And a lot of, very little of it is directly about our economy of about 35 million or so people uh, just, you know, just north of the U.S. Uh, but that said, uh, I suspect, but this is yet more stuff for empirical investigation, that things are pretty bad, but, but not as bad on dimensions like this in Canada uh, uh, when compared with the United States. Okay. So here, the first response to Cohen has to do with Cohen's claim about the infrequency and, you know, relatively uh, not so badness of the abuse of discretion. Uh, in the United States, Anderson argues it's pretty clear things are pretty bad and it's pretty rampant. Okay, now the second response responds to Cohen's claim that, look, uh, the free market uh, is able to do you know protect employees interests adequately uh, that you know the, the free market under conditions where employees have a decent exit uh, is able to uh, protect to, to protect these folks and in fact what the free market tends to do is the suggestion is it tends to reward folks who work under difficult working conditions with higher pay uh, and there's a couple of things that Anderson's going to say. The first thing she's going to say, well, if you look at the evidence, uh, the place where you find the worst and the highest frequency of abuses uh, is, is in these categories of lower paid and lower skilled workers. So it's really hard to find evidence that you get paid better uh, you, you, that the employers, employees are making a trade-off between working conditions and pay because these folks are in the lowest paid uh, sectors of the workplace. So that's one thing that I think, you know, one thing that she points out. Um, but the other thing, and I think this is her more powerful argument, is that, look, uh, Cohen's argument rests on a robust exit option for employees. And her point is, look, uh, employees don't have such a robust exit option. There is not a liquid labor market. It is not easy for employees to move from job to job. There is not 
a diverse array of packages of working conditions and pay uh, on offer for employees to purchase in this labor market. You have nothing like that kind of robust labor market in place. Uh, in fact, you have uh, uh, abiding unemployment that makes it very difficult, particularly for folks at the bottom of the income skew, to, uh, to, to exercise their exit option. So, you know, I think her response is, well, uh, maybe in theory you'd be right, though I think she'd even question that. Maybe in theory you'd be right, that things would be okay if employees had a robust exit option. But she's saying, look, in fact, they do not. Uh, unemployment's too high to th to, to, uh, for this robust exit option to have a chance in heck of doing what we need to do to restore a kind of accountability or equality of, of, a stand, of standing in the workplace to a sufficient degree to, and to protect against uh, abuses of employer discretion. Um, so she's gonna say, look, your arguments, your abstract arguments about uh, how the marketplace with a robust exit option could take care of these ills, well, they're just not very realistic. Cohen, you're not being very realistic about the state of the economy and the fact that unemployment's not going anywhere, significant levels of unemployment is not going anywhere anytime soon. I think I would say as an aside that uh, if Cohen were to respond uh, with, with a, a kind of claim like, well, let's do what we can to, uh, to make for a robust exit option by get, doing something very serious about abiding unemployment, then he would be, that would be a very radical proposal on his part uh, because that would require something like making the government as an employer of last resort uh, or making, you know, something like universal basic income, a permanent feature of uh, our economy or, you know, something pretty dramatic if this mechanism were going to do the job that he envisions for it, namely the exit option uh, mechanism. So Anderson here, I think, is actually being the more realistic one. Like, they're, they're, it's not anytime soon that we're going to get rid of abiding unemployment in our capitalist economy. Uh, so her idea is, well, then we got to do something to change it. And she thinks the, may, the way what we've got to do is uh, is to uh, what we've got to do is to introduce uh, workers' say into the process. I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Let me deal with one final specific response. Uh, and here, this gets back to Cohen's point that, look, any robust constraint, particularly in the version of giving employees say, is going to really undercut the logic of the economies of scale and authoritative organized production that Anderson recognizes is so important. Uh, uh, you know, so Cohen's idea is that, look, if you, if you hold employers accountable, yeah, you're gonna curb discretion, I mean, you're gonna uh, curb disputes of, uh, uh, abuse of discretion, but you're also gonna kill the golden goose. You're gonna like undercut the whole point of having uh, an authoritatively organized firm. Any robust constraint on the employer's authority, any robust form of democratic oversight of employer's authority is just gonna screw the whole thing up. It's, it's going to undercut uh, productivity and efficiency in the working place uh, too, uh, you know, too badly, uh, not worth the cost. So what Anderson says in response to that is that this is an empirical question. Uh, and she notes that Cohen really adduces just one article uh, for the claim that, uh, that firms with high levels of workplace accountability uh, do worse as a matter of productivity and efficiency uh, than your typical hierarchical, hierarchically structured firm. Uh, and let me, uh, uh, so, so let, let me, you know, let me just point to the passages where Anderson makes her argument. First, uh, you know, she says, Cohen cites a single study suggesting that the German system of co-determination co-determ depresses profits. And the idea is that, look, in these German co-determined firms, the profits to the shareholder are lower, 
and coincides that single study for the further supposition that the explanation for why profits to the shareholder are lower is because the workers are not as productive. Now, there's a couple of things that, uh, a couple of ways that we might try to rebut what Ty, uh, Cohen says here. Uh, the first way we might try to rebut what Cohen says here is actually to look to uh, the Schweikert reading that we just did. Because Schweikert cites a number of studies, not just one, but many, that note the heightened efficiency and productivity of worker-owned cooperatives. So the idea is that, look, the empirical literature is at best ambiguous on this, and then Schweikert, I think, would insist that there's more evidence that uh, worker, uh, you know, employee, employer accountable workplaces, democratic firms, as he calls them, like Mondragon and other workers cooperatives are actually more productive and more efficient. Uh, so that's one way we might respond. And Anderson chimes in with this and says, look, uh, I, I, I think what you're finding is ambiguous. You just suggest this, you just cite this single study and there's actually other studies out there that suggest the opposite of what you say about uh, the efficiency and productivity of these places. Now, another way that Anderson, so one, one way that Anderson goes after uh, Cohen is, is to say, look, the, your empirical claim is a shaky one. There's actually in the literature, there's countervailing evidence about the efficiency uh, and productivity of these places. But then the other is more of a conceptual claim. And here she says, wait, slow down, Cohen. Let's get really clear on what your study says. And, uh, and Anderson makes this actually in a footnote, this point in a footnote uh, to, uh, to the text on page 142. So you might want to chase down the footnote here to see the full argument. But what she says is, okay, wait, let's slow, let's slow down here. When you read the paper that Cohen provides, what that paper shows is that these co-determination these co firms in Germany, they systematically yield lower profits for the shareholder. So that means uh, less of the profit, uh, less of the net revenue is going to the shareholder in the form of profit. Now, what Anderson wants to say is, wait, that does not necessarily mean that the workplace is less efficient or less productive. What that means is that in this co-determining system, the shareholders are getting, you know, it means that they're getting a smaller profit, but it could be that the co-determining workers are just as productive and efficient, but because of this arrangement, they're able to hang on to more of the revenue in form of wages, which counts against the profits. Uh, and so then, so that's the force behind her sentence here on page 42. The wonder is why this study isn't seen as a point in favor of the German system, and that the people who actually do the work enjoy greater shares of the pie. So here she, char she, she counters Cohen on this kind of conceptual ground, saying, look, the study you cite's about profit. It's not about efficiency and productivity of the worker. Uh, uh, yeah. So I'm not sure it makes the point that you want it to make. And it also seems to make the, and it's consistent with this other point, which is the German system helps the, share, the worker get a greater share of the profit pie. Finally, Anderson has yet a third response. So, so he's got, she's got three responses to Cohen here on the, about the supposed inefficiency of the accountable systems or the accountable firms. The first point is that there is countervailing evidence about the productivity of, of democratic firms or more democratic firms in the literature. The second point is that, look, even the, the point that the study that Cohen cites uh, points to the wrong thing. It points to profit, not efficiency and productivity of the economic system. And then the third point is, and this is, this is yet another conceptual point, is that, look, the, the debate between us is about two different ways of letting workers uh, decide what they want. Cohen says, look, let's, let a, let's, let's, let, let's try to put into place this 
free market of labor uh, with a uh, robust exit option for the employees. Let's, let's try to put into place something like that and then let the employees as rational adults decide on this free market what package of wages and working conditions they want by selecting from you know, different employers that offer different packages of wages and working uh, uh, conditions. And then here, uh, uh, Cohen, or, uh, Anderson says, hey, you know, uh, I agree with you, Cohen. Employees should be able to choose. Uh, and I, uh, you know, I, I agree with you, but I advocate a different way to determine the value of workers' dignity and autonomy. I value a different way of enabling workers to choose their package. My way is just let them speak for themselves in the workplace. Let them vote on the package in the workplace, uh, as opposed to Cohen's idea of giving them just one opportunity to vote and that's like when that which is when they make a contract in you know in this labor uh, and employee marketplace so her idea is like look I think it's uh, more promising to give workers the choice of their package uh, 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 of pay for working conditions to give them that choice within the workplace uh, that's the more effective way to do it the better way to do it than Cohen's proposal of just trying to construct a market where they where they make that choice through this contract and as, as a wage labor. Okay. Um, all right, so so here we've concluded with these two different responses, and they're, they, they're kind of interdependent and interrelated. W one response uh, is focused on Cohen's argument that worker say undercuts worker productivity. Uh, the second uh, response focuses on uh, this I, Cohen's idea that uh, that we shouldn't be paternalistic with respect to employees. We should let them choose their package of working conditions and uh, and set and uh, working conditions and uh, pay. And here, you know, as I said. Anderson's response to this claim is that yes, we should give them say, but we, my way of giving them say is more promising than your way of giving them say. My way of giving them say is to give them a vote in the workplace. Your way is to hope that we can give them a sufficiently robust exit option and that the free market will give them a meaningful say in their choice of workplace conditions. All right. That's all I have to say about the interchange between Cohen and uh, Anderson. Let me now just say a few things that are going to bring together uh, some of the themes of the course here as we get toward the end of the course. And I just want to give you a kind of capsule summary of where these various folks we've been looking at uh, here in the middle uh, toward the end of the course fall. Uh, so we've looked at Rousseau, Schweikert, Anderson, and we're going to be looking at uh, these other folks, uh, Kelly and Howard, in their book, Making a Democratic Economy. All of these folks are advocates of, uh, of a set of values that, can be that, that are commonly described using any one of these terms. They are all advocates of what we might call Republican freedom or non-domination. They're all advocates of what we might call solidarity, and they're all advocates of egalitarian value, where that egalitarian value is spelled out in terms of equal say, equal consideration of interest, and equal social esteem. Uh, just to be clear, for this set of folks, the ideas of Republican freedom and non-domination, ideas of solidarity, and ideas of egalitarian value, those are roughly interchangeable ideas. They're, they, the content's the same, even though the words used to describe them vary uh, from author to author, and uh, uh, and you know, and even within the same author in different passages. Now Rousseau kind of kicked this whole thing off, this way of thinking at things off. Uh, Rousseau, uh, you know, Rousseau says, look, to get these things, we really need two institutional innovations. One, we need some sort of democratic assembly where the general will can be formed. 
Uh, and then he also says we also have to have rules in place that keep uh, inequalities of income and wealth from getting out of hand. And those two things together, those are what we need to realize throughout the society at large, uh, Republican freedom. Now Schweikert says, well, to get those things, you got to do more than what Rousseau suggested. I mean, you have to keep the democratic institutions, uh, and that and those democratic institutions need to be, you know, must oversee this whole thing. But you also have to change the economy as whole as a whole. We have to leave coupon corporate shareholder capitalism. We must move to an economy where everything must be organized in the form of a workers' cooperative, or at least anything above a certain size must be organized in that way. And we must build a system of community bank capital funding to replace the shareholder uh, function of uh, of capitalizing these various uh, workers' cooperative, these various firms. So Schweikert's proposing, like, if you if you want Republican freedom, this is the kind of change you've got to make. Anderson's not quite as radical as Schweikert. Anderson's, I think, more piecemeal. Uh, the term she uses at one point, uh, even, and I cited it in this lecture, she wants to be a little bit more pra pragmatic and experimental. And her idea is that, look, we just need to start introducing democratic controls of some sort in the workplace. And we need to just kind of work out over time exactly what the best way is to give people say uh, in the workplace. It might be uh, the German system of co-determination. It might be reviving unions. It might be uh, um, a more widespread use of workers' cooperatives. Um, she's more experimental. She's not as confident that you need, uh, uh, she's just not sure if you need something as thoroughgoing as Schweikert proposes or not. And she's certainly not asserting like Schweikert does that, like, look, if you want this, this is what you've got to do. She's, you know, basically she's saying, look, uh, in a piecemeal, pragmatic way, we need to address the problem of private governments in the workplace and kind of work slowly to this goal of widespread Republican freedom in this society. Kelly and Howard, I think, fit quite a bit with uh, Anderson's project. I think they're just a little further down the road. Uh, and they also seem to be less interested in getting the government to do these things. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about Kelly and Howard, uh, you know, here in the next few days. But what they wanna do is, uh, they're, they're sort of movement. They're, they're actually, you know, they're philosophers or theorists who want to get a movement going. They're kind of activists. And what they want to do, they don't so much want to change the big structural laws, say like Schweikert might, or even like Anderson seems to want to do. Uh, it's not that they're opposed to that, but their primary thrust is to say, what we need to do is just start building these workers' cooperatives uh, and, you know, just creating these workers' prop, uh, the cooperatives and to kind of build a, a, a you know a set of institutions where people are realizing these values and the hope is that in these workers cooperatives that get built like you know in cities like Cleveland or uh, cities like uh, Preston uh, uh, Lancashire in uh, the UK and you know maybe cities like Hamilton we try to build clusters of workers cooperatives I uh, remember Montragon as well in the Basque region maybe we try to build these things and maybe we build them and people will see how good life can be when one's a worker in one of these things and how competitive and productive these things can be. So Kelly and Howard, they're going to, they are going to say, well, let's just start doing this. We don't really need to change the laws. What we need to do is just organize people, start working these workers' cooperatives, and maybe we'll build a movement towards something that's more thoroughgoingly uh, free in the Rousseauian sense, uh, non-dominating the Rousseauian sense. Uh, we'll be getting to Kelly Howard uh, in the next couple of days. Okay, thank you. Um, but let me say one final thing about where the course is going. I think with this lecture, we have now seen the main guts of the course. It, they're, they're out there. The, the main things I've wanted to say in this course, I've said, main material I've wanted to expose you to, I, I have done that. I do want to uh, discuss and uh, Kel uh, Kelly and Howard a bit, and there will be a little bit of Kelly and Howard on the final exam, but there won't be much. Uh, at this point, 
going forward, the Kelly and Howard readings, I very much want you to read them. There is going to be some things you're going to be held accountable to. But my idea for the last, last few days after Tuesday's discussion section is that you're going to go into more of a synthesizing mode and start you know, dedicating your time to finishing your last commentary and response paper and to getting ready for that final exam that's going to be on Thursday. So our emphasis is going to move away from the readings toward like summarizing and synthesizing what's going on in the course in a whole. The emphasis in my, in, 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 certainly in the discussion sections, is going to focus on that. My lectures for Kelly and Howard are going to be, uh, well, so I promise, very short because there's they're just little tidbits here and there that I want you to get. Hopefully, the Kelly and Howard readings will make, mainly strike you as enjoyable. Uh, uh, they're certainly not as philosophically taxing as anything we've read. So the idea is now the, the really hard philosophical ideas, really hard conceptual ideas, most of the empirical stuff has already been presented to you. Now I'd like you to turn to synthesizing uh, all this information, getting ready for the final, finishing those last couple of assignments.